I am going to talk a little bit about fire, but no more than about half an hour or so. So this is really like a, a review of the basics um, that I think everybody needs to, to know, really to make sure that we're on the same wavelength. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about, um, about what's happening within the fire community, what's happening out there now, and some of the standards and some of the acronyms that you're going to come across. I won't have time to go into them in any kind of detail, but I I'd like for you to know what they are so that you can recognise them in the future. Uh, I'll talk about exchange paradigms, I'm going to touch on GDPR. That's actually, I've got that wrong, general part of particular, no, GDPR, that's right. Um, associate standards, profiling, and where is fire going? So that's, that's my hour this morning. Um, so, what is FIRE? So FIRE stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. So FAST because it's intended to be rapid to do stuff with it and to develop in it. Um, healthcare because that's all we do. Interoperability because we're about sharing and resources because they're a key component of, of what's involved in FIRE. As I've said, if you know FIRE already, you know this stuff. Uh, I fully understand if you want to go and check your email or do something rather than listen to me. So FIRE it's an HL7 interoperability standard for sharing both clinical and administrative data. And I like to think about FIRES that there's two main parts to it. The first part is the content model, and these are the resources, and we'll talk a bit more about those in just a second. The second part, which is really important, is the exchange specification. So that's actually how to shift stuff around. And again, we're going to talk about this also in this first half an hour, because it is important to understand how you're moving stuff, what your paradigm is. But there's a, there's a third part, which is almost the most important part about FIRE, and that is the community. And you're sort of seeing a, an example of it here, but the FIRE community worldwide is enormous. Um, hands up who has used the FIRE chat, chat.fire.org. Okay, a couple of you. It would be nice if the others of you, chat.fire.org, go in there after this event and go and have a look. Um, there are thousands, literally thousands of people around the world that subscribe to that. It's a place where you can ask a question about FIRE and get an answer, often within minutes. It's a really, really useful resource. So that, that community is, the, is, is the, one of the biggest assets of, of, of FIRE. Graham, Graham Grieve, who kind of started this whole thing off, calls FIRE a treasure. And I think he's exactly right because it's brought people together to talk about healthcare interoperability. Uh, conversation that Ian and I were having just before we started this, uh, this, this session. So, where does FIRE fit with other interoperability standards, particularly with eight or seven interoperability standards? So, I put the slide up really just to kind of put FIRE in context with the other ways that we currently share data, and to talk just a very little bit about you know what the future of those uh, uh, those are. So H07 version 2 is a message-based sharing paradigm. It's used for, um, say, when a, when a, hosp a patient is admitted into a hospital and the hospital uh, P uh, admin system wants to tell the LIS system that the patient's there. Uh, it's been around since 1997. Um, it's going to be around for a very long time. We do not expect that H07 version 2 is going to disappear any time soon. So whilst FIRE can theoretically do what version 2 can do, as I say, our expectation, uh, our expectation is that it's going to be around for a while. Version 3, which um, gained, has been used uh, quite a bit here in the UK, slightly less of a rosy outcome. Uh, from the H07 perspective, it's a specification that we're continuing to support, but we're not continuing to enhance. Our expectation is that version 3 will be replaced by fire-based exchanges in a, you know, sort of a medium kind of time frame. CDA, the Clinical Document Architecture, which is a, a type of version 3. Um, again, we, our expectation is this is going to be around for a little while, but what's happening, and particularly in the UK, is that fire documents are starting to uh, be developed. And I think that as, as those fire documents mature and as we learn how to use them, CDA will, will disappear from the landscape. Apart from anything else, anybody who's tried to get structured data out of a CDA document will know how hard that is. And that's an issue that FIRE has resolved. And then, of course, FIRE itself, uh, about six years old. So that's the, that's the landscape of, of HL7 interoperability standards. I talked about resources. What are they? So resources are the content model. Resources are the things that we actually move around. Um, I'm just going to put my glasses on because I can't easily see the screen. Um, I noticed, by the way, it's quite interesting. I don't know if anybody else noticed. I kind of hope you didn't. But the last time I spoke here in November, I had a really old pair of glasses, and they were kind of like that. 
And I didn't realise they were like that until I saw the uh, video of me. And I showed it to my wife, who said, ha, 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 told you not to wear those glasses. So she was very sympathetic, and I felt very good about that. So these glasses are even. If they become uneven, I'm going to rely on you to tell me that so I can change them. Now, the thing about the, uh, the resources, as I say, the content model, it doesn't matter how you move them around, they are the same thing. And we'll talk to that a little bit more in just a second. The other big thing I'd like to point out is that they didn't arise just because you know, the fire community sat down and thought that these were a good thing. Uh, these have been informed by work inside and outside of, of HL7, from the organisations there. Opening HR in particular is, is one of the organisations that we worth, work with to try and develop and to, and to um, improve these resources. And here is an example of, of some clinical resources. We've got about 120 odd resources in the spec altogether. Uh, and and when, I, when I show this slide, and as I say, if you were here last time, you probably would have seen it, is there are two things that I, I like to point out. So the first is that every resource has got a name. And that name is descriptive. You look at something which says medication, and you're pretty, a pretty good idea what it is. And it works the other way. So if you are looking for a resource to represent immunizations, again, it's quite straightforward to find it. And this cuts to the, to, to the, the core of the fact that fire is easy to use by people who are not familiar with the healthcare domain. And what we're finding is that uh, developers can now develop systems using, and they don't have to have the huge upskilling of knowledge that you otherwise would have. If anyone's actually worked with version 2, for example, you'll be aware that you actually need to spend a fair bit of time to, to understand what it all means. Whereas with fire, we've had examples in our connectathons um, internationally where people have come in knowing nothing about fire and develop systems within a couple of days. Literally within two days, somebody wrote a mobile system that could access fire data from a, from a, a fire server. So that's that ease of use, that developer friendliness that fire is there. And that's going to encourage innovation, uh, along with a few other standards moving forwards. The other comment I would make on this particular slide, and this is sort of like the warning bit, is that fire is an evolving standard. So it's not fully baked and it is changing. So currently it's at what we call release three, which is the third version of the, of the standard. We're expecting release four to come out at the end of this year. But the, um, when you use a particular resource, you do need to be aware that the details can change with the new, uh, with the new version. There's a good and a bad in that. The good thing is that what it, what it means is that the resources can be uh, adapted and we can, we can check and we can be sure that they are fit for purpose. As I say, the bad thing is you do have to be aware of that change. We actually think of, of um, fire resources in a maturity model, uh, we, we, similar to the CMM uh, maturity model. So uh, each particular resource has got a maturity level. It's a number. Uh, the higher the number, the more mature it is. And eventually it will get to a point where we're satisfied that it's, it's, it's fit for purpose. And at that point, it will become what we call normative. And it will always be backwards compatible. You'll see that number in the spec. And in fact, we'll be going in there at some point. So we'll, I'll point that out. So those are the resources. For the um, technical people, this is what a resource looks like on the wire. Would anybody who's not a fire expert like to hazard a guess as to what resource this, uh, this is intended to represent? Patient. Yeah, not that hard. So again, for those who have to work on the wire, uh, contrast something like this with, uh, with say, a version 2 or a, or a CDA or a version 3 message, and it becomes very easy to read. There's the name of the resource up through there. Each of these are the properties down through there. And this, this example calls out the four main parts that exist in any resource. So the first part is up here is the metadata. And that's things like the ID, the uh, date it was last updated, privacy tags fit in there, uh, and so forth. Here is the text. All resources can have a text element. We call this the lesson of CDA. So what it means is that even if you can't look at the coded data inside of a resource, you can look at that text and know what it actually means. And the, the guidance that we give as part of the community is to say that it should be possible to show the text to a person and be clinically safe. In other words, everything which a clinician should know about should be present in that text element. Down here, I'll jump down to that third thing. Here we have the structured data inside of the resource. I'll talk a bit more about that later on. And here we have an extension. So 
By design, resources in fire are intended to be small and easy to understand. We have what we call the rule of 80%, where something made it into the core if and only if 80% of systems were using that element. Um, and then we added an extensibility mechanism on top of that, so you can then add the special things for you. So as an example, in New Zealand, uh, we, have, we have a Maori population, we have the concept of hapu and iwi, tribal affiliations. So what we would do is we would create extensions to represent hapu and iwi, and there is a well-defined mechanism here, that URL points to the definition of that, uh, of that extension. And that's a requirement in FHIR. If you create an extension, you must create a computable description of that extension. So if you receive a resource which has an extension you don't understand, you can always go and find out what it means. So that's the extensibility mechanism. I point that out because if you go looking at the spec, probably the first thing you're going to do is say, half the stuff I need is missing. That's by design, and that's the uh, way to resolve it. This is another key uh, aspect of FHIR. The concept of re references between resources. This is going to be really important to you this afternoon because this is what you're going to be doing. A resource on its own, like a procedure resource, is not that useful. You know, it just If this was, say, an appendicectomy, um, it would simply say, appendicectomy performed on such and such. What the references do is they give us the subject. Who was it performed on? Um, out the performer, who did it, uh, where was it done, within which encounter, what was the reason, and so forth. So again, very key concept. You build up a clinical scenario using references between resources. And again, and Amir's going to walk you through this uh, this morning, and you're doing it this afternoon, is you're going to take clinical scenarios and you're going to pick and choose the resources that you need to create that scenario. By the way, if anyone does have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. We're a wee bit time, time constrained, but uh, if it's a short one, I can answer it. Otherwise, we'll take it offline. So if you do have a question, sing out. There's also this afternoon, which is quite free to Yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a, a pretty, pretty free-flowing free session. Um, this is what the resource looks like in the, um, in the specification. Uh, you'll see, and I've used the patient as the example there, down here are the list of the standard properties inside that, inside that resource. So a patient has got an identifier, it's got a name, telecom, that's your um, telephone number, fax, email, that kind of stuff, birth date, and so on and so forth. Uh, this line here, those numbers, tell you how many of each element can exist in a resource. So, for example, the, an identifier, which could be like an NHS number, you can have none of them or many of them. Whereas something like the gender, you can have only one, but it's optional. So that cardinality or multiplicity is what that's called, is quite important. Then you have a data type. I'm going to come back to data types in just a second because they're important. And then over here, you have the description of what each element actually means. You'll see a couple of oddies. This guy here that's got the X against it, uh, that's what we call a choice element. And that means that this particular element can either be a Boolean, it's true or it's false, or it can be a date time in this particular case. Uh, and you'll also come across uh, what we call uh, backbone elements down here. So the contact, you can have multiple contacts and each contact can have different elements. So what I want to do, I want to dig into this concept of data types. So as you can see, each element has got a particular data type. What is a data type? We are, there are two kinds of data types in FHIR. There are primitive data types and there are complex data types. These are the primitive ones. Now, um, Amir and I had a, had a discussion when we were putting this presentation together and Amir said, this stuff is too complicated. You see, there's the, there's the complex one coming up there. He said, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go near there. And I said, nah. I suspect he was probably right. Don't sweat the details on this. The concept that I want to get across is that an element has a particular data type, and that particular data type tells you what can be inside of it. So a resource is kind of like a bag of elements, each of which a data type. The simple ones are things like an instance in time, or a date, uh, or the Boolean that we've seen before, or a string for text. So they're the simple ones. They have just a value. And then you get to the more complicated ones like this. Now, as I say, I'm going to admit, Amir is right, this is kind of complicated. It's actually 
quite simple when you know what the trick is, because the trick is that you actually have the name of the data type there, it's a quantity, and then it's children down through, down through there. And you can see that better on this slide here, where we have a data type called human name, so it's like a patient's name or a practitioner's name, and the name can have where it is to be used, what its text is, the family, so on and so forth. So when you see a, a data type, you can kind of understand what's the sort of information that you can collect against that particular element. Again, it will become a lot more evident, I think, as you go through. But that concept of data types is important to understand. Another really important thing to understand is terminology. Fire is not a terminology system. So fire is a way of representing data, but fire interacts very well with terminology systems. And it does so uh, using this picture. Again, don't sweat the details of this particular picture. The bits that I want to point out is you start with a code system such as SNOMED or Low Inc or a local one, so if you're, I forget what the name is, for your medications. So the, the code system is what defines the concepts that you want. Then you have this guy called a value set, another important concept. The value set is a thing which selects a subset of concepts for one or more code system for use in a particular context. I'm going to break this down in just a second to make it more obvious to make it more obvious. But the value set is something that you need to know about because when you are profiling, when you are making fire work for you, one of the things you almost certainly will be doing is creating value sets against a existing or a new code system. And then we have the actual individual resources will then point to a value set and the instances will point to the, the code system. I'll show you this in just a second. Um, so the value set, uh, it's used for coded elements. So, I mean, coded data is actually quite critical for semantic interoperability, as I'm sure Ian or anybody else will agree. Uh, the more we can code data, the more we can have something which references that, that known, uh, known terminology, the more accurate the exchange of data and the, the more secondary use we get out of it. Because what we're seeing is that data we're collecting clinically is really, really useful for secondary purposes. Obviously, there's privacy and other things to think about. But things like decision support and personalised medicine all depend on having accurate coded data. This is an example, so it's similar, similar to a SNOMED ref set. If you're a SNOMED person, it's not exactly the same, but it's a similar kind of concept, a subset. It uh, can be altered in uh, profiling or curation. And for example, verification status is a property of a condition, and there is the set of possible values that it can have. Now, I'm just at this stage. I think I'm just at this stage. No, almost, almost. So, here we have, I'm coming back now to the resource. I've used a condition this time through here, but take a look over here. What you can see is a category, which is optional and can have many. This is a data type of codable concept, which is the coded element. And then over here, you see where um, uh, you see the, the, the value sets. So let's just go and take a look at that in the spec. Yeah. If I go to, so this is the version three, um, release three rather specification. There it is, you can find it. Again, it's quite a readable thing. I would encourage people to go take a look at it. Um, there are a number of ways you can, um, you, you can access it. Personally, I find it easiest to go to this resources tab uh, and then get an alphabetical list. And here are the resources which are defined in FHIR. That number there is that maturity number I was telling you about. So account has got a lowish maturity, uh, whereas patient at five has got a fairly high maturity. We're going to go and take a look at uh, the condition resource, maturity three. And here is, you'll see when you look at a resource, you have at the top here a description about what the resource is trying to do, its scope and its usage. Um, its relationship to other resources, and here is the guts of it. So here is the definition of the condition resource. Uh, and if we look at the category that I was telling you about before, we see it's a category, there's the comment about it, optional but many, it's a codable concept. Incidentally, if I, I talked before about how complex data types have had children, so if I just click on that, it will take me to 
the definition of what a codable concept is. So via the spec is hyperlinked up the wazoo. You can you can um, move around it. That's an expression we use, isn't it? Wazoo. It's not rude or anything. I, Okay, I, I, I once used a fairly rude word in a, in a thing quite by accident. I try not to do it again. Um, but over here, this is what I want to point out. So, uh, we clinical status. You see here that that is, the, that is the value set. That's how you find out what are the optional values. And this concept here is what we call the binding strength. And the binding strength is all about whether you can change the set of values for your purpose. And in, in this particular case... This is a required binding, so you cannot change the set of values in this particular uh, example. This one down here is an example binding, which means you can change it as much as you like. This is really more important when you're profiling or curating resources, but it's an important concept. And again, if I just click on that, like so, I will get the definition there of what that means. So again, very easy to, to move around inside of, inside of FIRE. So I will go back to my presentation. So that's all I'm going to talk about, sort of resources and the real basics. Any particular questions that have come out of, out of that so far? Can I just mention, just to reassure everybody, this is like a whirlwind tour, but we will get into the detail and hands dirty to, to learn this stuff this afternoon. Yeah. So, you know, like at clinical school or nursing school or all the other clinical you know, places we learned, it was the see one, do one, teach one. Y you really need to actually get stuck in to learn this stuff. So don't, don't worry if it feels difficult at the moment. It's yeah. a whirlwind tour so that we can get our hands dirty this afternoon. And, and as always, there was a short test at the end of, of this presentation <laughs> as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to move off from that and I want to talk about, um, about exchange paradigms. So this is, at the very beginning, I said that there were two important things about FIRE. One was the uh, content model, resources, which we just looked at. And the second is the exchange specification, how we actually shift things around. So when you're doing something in, a, in an interoperability project, it's actually quite important to decide what paradigm you're, you're, you're in up front. And we recognise four different paradigms. The restful paradigm is the real-time interaction. So that's the example of an application that runs on a mobile phone or a laptop uh, or a, um, a tablet interacting in real time with a fire server. And the example that I told you before about the developer who wrote something in a couple of days, so that was using the restful interface. It's the most well-developed inside of fire because this was actually what was, what was missing in healthcare interoperability. We were well um, well suited for, for messaging and such like, but we didn't have any good examples for a mobile phone. And that's actually what drove fire. I mean, just imagine, for example, saying to a mobile app developer, use a V2 message, or a V3 message, or a CDA document. You know, they'd, they'd just go away. So the restful paradigm is one that's used in that sort of space. Services are kind of like restful, except we hide complex functionality a, a, a behind a simple interface. An example of that is terminology expansion which you will see this afternoon, where you can type in a simple word like asthma, get back a list of all the matching concepts from, um, from a value set and a terminology. Um, decision support is another example of doing that. Then we come down to messaging. So the messaging paradigm, which is very similar to version 2, H07 version 2, is where an event has happened and I want to tell somebody about the event. Once they've updated their systems, I can chuck the message away, other than for audit services, audit purposes. Or I want to get them to do something. I want to place an order. I want a lab test to be done. So I send my message to the lab system, which actions my, my order, and again, then the message can be thrown away. So a messaging system, the actual messages themselves, do something and then go away, as opposed to documents. So a document is a summary, a clinical summary at a point in time. We're going to go into more about documents in this session because they are important in your, in your context here. But the example of a document will be a discharge summary or a referral letter or a progress note. It's part of the clinical record. It's a summary, and you keep it forever, unlike the, unlike the message. Now, when you get down to the wire, regardless of what your paradigm is, you are moving resources around. And as we'll see, things like documents and messages are actually just packages of resources. Uh, and here's an example of where we might get, a, say, a lab result as an observation from a, from a message 
We might have a tablet device, a nurse or a doctor is entering data <coughs> like, a, um, like a pulse rate or something like that, and they're entering an arrestful paradigm. And then when we create the discharge summary, we pick up all of those uh, resources, package them into a document, and send them out the door. So because we're using the same resources in each of those paradigms, it becomes very easy to put them into different places. Right here, right now, this is not that simple because each of these steps here, here, and here requires mapping. Mapping between structures, mapping between content. So the promise of FIRE is it's going to make all of this stuff a lot easier, a lot quicker, a lot safer. So as I've said, I want to go into a bit more details about FIRE. And for those who were here last year, we're starting to get into the slightly newer territory. So if you could just sort of stop checking your emails there and, and, and watch this again. I, I wasn't joking about the test. <laughs> um, well, I was, but, but I, I lie. Unfortunately, quite often that, that sort of happens. But I, I do want to talk more about documents. So clinically, what is a document? As I've said, it's a summary at a point in time. Uh, it's the discharge summary, the mental health, emergency care discharge, and so forth. And a document has got a number of things inside it. It's got metadata about the document, the name of the patient, the person who wrote it, the type of document that it was, the place where it occurred, and that sort of thing. And then it has clinical data inside of sections inside it, meds on admission, the patient's problem list, uh, reason for admission, so on and so forth. And it can have a signature, it can be signed. A document is something which can be attested to be true. And in HL7, we actually think of a document as having these particular characteristics. I won't necessarily go through them in detail, well, I'm happy to do so, but persistence is where it's stored. As I say, it's part of the clinical record. If you get a discharge summary, you expect to store it and get it back again sometime. Someone looks after it. We can sign it. It's got context inside of it. It's, it's wrapped up into something. It's, a, it's, it's about a, a particular admission, or it's about a particular referral. It has context. It's whole. You treat the whole thing as a, as, as, a, as a thing. And human readability, quite important. A document is something that you should be able to show to a human, and the human should be able to read it and understand it. In FIRE, this is how we represent it. Technically, in FIRE, a document is a collection of resources, and remember that graph I showed you before, that procedure? So exactly the same resources. The one thing is we have this particular resource called a composition. Now, I'm not going to give anything away, but I am going to point out that you should remember, um, for, <coughs> for a scenario four, um, should remember this particular uh, resource. And the composition contains both the, the sort of the metadata um, about the document and the metadata can sometimes be a reference, sometimes it's an actual data item itself, and it has the sections down through there. And again, the sections here can have text, and they can also have references to the particular uh, resources that, that are represented by that. FIRE has got particular rules about how you render a composition. Specifically what it says is you take the text of the subject, the text of the composition, and the text of all the sections, bind them up to bang them together, that is your document. Uh, and as I say, the document can be signed because, again, in healthcare, it's quite important to be able to do that. Um, and I think that's all I was going to say. Oh, and there's a particular uh, resource here called a bundle resource, which is a container. So the bundle resource, unlike other resources, is designed to hold whole resources. So this is how, when you're creating this bundle, which represents a discharge summary, say, you have the composition which pulls the whole thing together, these indiv individual resources, and you can now see, hopefully, how it becomes a lot easier to pull data out of the document because it's actually got an allergy intolerance resource inside it. So Amir talked to the idea, or talked to his colleague, who said, gee, oh, what I want is I want to be able to get a discharge summary and then pull the data out of it and update my own, my own data with it, under my control, of course. Well, here's how you can do it. You just all a recipient system would need to do is to pull out the allergy intolerance, show it on a screen, and say, import or not, click on it, job done. It's very hard to do that in the other paradigms, particularly in CDA and such like. OK, so I believe that that's all I'm going to talk about at the moment in, um, uh, about documents. As Amir has said, there's, 
This is a bit of a whirlwind tour. The first bit was pretty basic. If you know fire, you kind of knew this stuff. I'm going to just touch on some other points I think of interest. I'm not going to go into any of them in any great kind of detail, but I want to. I just want to. I want to make some comments on them. So the, the 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 GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations, coming in. Gosh, a couple of weeks, I think, isn't it? Okay, a couple, couple of days then. Days, weeks, you know. Um, so fire itself is not a security standard, okay? Um, but it integrates with, with, with security systems. You can imagine GDPR is getting quite a bit of profile within the fire community at the moment. Uh, and when we were at uh, Cologne last week, there was in fact a, a whole uh, connectathon based on the GDPR and how we're going to support the GDPR. Uh, that's a link there, and as you can download the spec, go and have a look. But that talks into some kind of detail about how FIRE supports the thinking behind the GDPR. We actually also had a talk on the GDPR by a lawyer at Cologne, which is really quite interesting, but she sort of pointed out that in a lot of cases, the details of the GDPR are going to be worked out when somebody gets sued. Um, she actually said case law, which is a nice way of putting it. So it's going to be a really interesting ride moving forwards. Um, so our feeling is that privacy, a fire is actually pretty well aligned with a privacy type framework, which of course is part of what GDPR is. So we have things like an audit event uh, for tracking stuff that's happened, provenance for saying where something comes from, and a consent resource, which is where somebody can say who can share their data. And again, one of the tracks we did in um, New Orleans in January was to show working a system where a patient could go in, set their consent, and then a client could see a certain set of data. They could go back, change their consent, and the data which was exposed subsequently changed. So this stuff's been thought about and been worked on for a little while. Um, all resources can have a security tag. You may remember that that, so when I showed you that XML picture of the patient, and I said there were four parts of, to a resource, one of them being the metadata. Well, in the metadata, we have these concepts of tags. That's where you can say, this resource is sensitive. Maybe it's mental health, maybe it's um, uh, substance abuse or something like that. Fire doesn't say exactly what sensitive means. That's up to you. It provides a placeholder for your systems to tag something, hence its name. We have advice for authentication and authorization, being the smart, smart on fire, which I will show you in just a second. And there's a whole page in the specification that talks about security. We have identity resources, resources which show what a something is, a patient, a related person, practitioner. So what we're doing at the moment, so we, the, the outcome of that, uh, of that uh, connectathon was that by and large we think we're pretty well established. We think there are some gaps uh, and you'll see them, uh, if you, I'm sorry, that link right there is a blog, it's a guy called uh, John Murkey, who's been involved in HL7 security for some time. He's done a write-up, so if you want the details, that's the place to go. Uh, the intention is that the security group will create a white paper which will say, you know, where the gaps are and such like. So if this is something you're interested in, uh, that blog is well worth taking a read of. Uh, and that link there is to the fire chat where this stuff is to be discussed. And as I said right at the very beginning, you know, there is a whole chat where you can go and ask questions and, and you all get answers. And please feel free to do so. There is, it's a friendly community. There is no such thing as a stupid question. There are stupid answers, but there are no such things as stupid questions. I'm really good at stupid questions, by the way, and I, I tell you. So you won't get flamed. Uh, don't be embarrassed. Go along and, and become part of, that, part of that community. Smart. I touched on smart. Again, this is something that I think you will hear and you should know about. So it stands for Substitutable Medical Applications and Reusable Technologies, which is why they shortened it down to SMART. It was actually developed by, and that's a link there for more data, developed by a really smart guy called Josh Mandel, who's a clinician in Boston Children's Hospital. Or he was, he now works at Google. Uh, and what he was trying to do is he wanted to open up data that was inside of EHRs. He wanted to make it easier for app developers to write applications that could use data in, that were existing inside of an EHR, like CERN or EPIC or something like that, or Orion for that matter. Uh, he, he, uh, and he was doing this about four, four years ago, and then FIRE started, started to become prominent, and so Josh joined the FIRE community, and now SMART is a FIRE standard. There's two kind of aspects to it. Oh, sorry. It's, originally, it was limited to this EHR stuff I was telling you about. 
but it's coming the de facto authentication mechanism, which is why you're going to hear about it. Two aspects to it. It defines how to launch an application in the context of an EHR um, or outside of an EHR and to access its data. And it's effectively a, a profile on OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Again, there's a ton of details around if you're interested. Um, I, I don't want to go into it now, not in the time that I've got. Uh, but but there's, um, there's a sandbox to play with. There's the spec there. Uh, you can talk about it as a smart chat if you're interested. And that's actually that's quite interesting. That's an app gallery. So that's a gallery of all the applications that people have already written using smart to access fire servers. So there's a growth chart application in there, for example, pediatric growth chart, nice little pictures and things like that. So that's what smart is. CDS hooks is something else that you're also going to come across. Uh, CDS, clinical decision support, CDS hooks defines a way of invoking external decision support from within an EHR, sharing context. In other words, an example being in this one here, for example, is a prescription. So it's triggered or hooked off an action occurring inside a PMS, uh, in this case prescribing something, and then the, the service, the external service, can then be invoked, and effectively you're saying, look, I'm, um, I'm prescribing this drug for this patient, any, any issues. Uh, the service here has got the capability of, um, sorry, over there, of reading further data out of the EHR, so it could say, well, what's the current medication list, has the patient got any significant problems, any previous allergies, and so on and so forth. And then it presents cards back to the clinician. Now, obviously, this requires lots of security, privacy, all that kind of stuff, and that's what you will see inside of the spec. It builds on smart, which is why it's important to know what smart actually is. But the big thing that this does is it decouples the creation of decision support from a user system. So what that means is that it allows for these services to be developed um, independently, and you can then pick and choose between different services. How am I going time-wise? Not too bad? Yes. Okay. Uh, again, lots of detail in there if you are interested, but I, again, I come back to it. I just want you to be aware of what, of what it actually is. Hands up who hasn't heard of blockchain. Excellent. You can't give an IT presentation these days without mentioning blockchain. If I'd been smart, what I would have done is say, this is collisions on fire with blockchain. We'd have had 10 times as many people along. <laughs> Blockchains, people have gone nuts over blockchain. I, 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 I mean, you probably know this, but a, a company that doing, changed, it, changed its name and its share price tripled. And it's because they put blockchain in it. So what is blockchain? Blockchain is the, t by the way, who, who, who knows what blockchain already is? Good eye, excellent. All right, well, in that case, I won't spend too much time on this. It's the technology behind Bitcoin, which is a, um, a virtual um, uh, name falls out of my head. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's effectively a, a distributed list of transactions which can be cryptographically signed. In English, what that means is that if you try and change it, you'll know about it. You can't change it um, without detection. We don't know really where blockchain and fire sit. We're kind of waiting a wee bit to see what happens with blockchain. Uh, the sorts of areas that we, we currently believe, we don't believe that clinical data is going to be stored on a blockchain. Just too big, too much of it. But tamper-proof audit records, GDPR we're talking about, there's a possible fit. Because right here, right now, audit records are in a database. It's quite possible for a really smart um, hacker to get in and change those audit records, which you cannot do. Provider authentication is another one that's coming about. What, what's, um, what degrees, what qualifications does a provider have? Particularly in the US, that's, that's a big one. I'm not so sure over here. Okay, so back to fire for a second, and I, we are getting towards the end of, of this, this, this bit. I did want to talk about profiling. So again, key topics, key points to remember. Uh, we've talked about a few of them already. Uh, profiling is another one. And profiling is effectively the act of making fire meet or fit your particular needs. And the issue here is that there's many different ways, many different contexts, many different ways of storing information. I, I gave you a patient example before. You know, in New Zealand, we want a harpoon and an iwi. Um, in the UK, you want something else. I don't know what it is. Um, but the point is we don't want a New Zealand patient and a UK patient in the core resource. What we want to be able to do is we want to say, here's the patient, and here's how I use it in the UK, here's how I use it in New Zealand. That's what profiling is about. And really, 
that's the guts of, of what all this means. We want these, what we call usage statements, to be authored in a structured way so that we can do stuff with them. We can download them, we can validate against them, we can present UIs based on them. Uh, there's three things that you do when you're profiling. And incidentally, profiling and curation, kind of the same thing, really. Uh, you constrain a resource, you take something out, or you change the number of them that can be. Change that binding that I was telling you about. It's where those value sets come in. That's why you need to understand the concept of value sets, because you'll be doing that, and extensions we've already talked about. So that's what profiling or curation is. It's adapting fire for your particular need. This is just an example here. Uh, you might want to say that the identifier has to use the NHS number, and you've got to have it. Um, incidentally, making things required, think real careful before you do that, because there are use cases under which you might not have a, a, a NHS number, unconscious patient, for example. So making stuff required requires careful thought. Um, but you might want to say that there can only be one name. In, in FHIR, there are multiple names. You might want to say that there's only one. There's your value set. You don't support photo and so forth. So that's what profiling is. And curation, um, in the into open sense, is creating profiles. And we're approaching the end. Where is FHIR going? So what's actually happening with FHIR um, since I last spoke? So more resources are coming along. Fire's kind of weird. It started out being fairly small and constrained. It's now become huge, uh, really huge. It's actually kind of hard for any one person to understand all of it, unless you're someone like Graham Grieve. Uh, who, Graham Grieve, by the way, who, did, who knows Graham? Knows of Graham Grieve. Okay. So he's not human. Uh, he actually is a good example of robotics, uh, because that's the only possible reason why he's always online. Um, moving resources to normative. So, what, and by normative, let me define that. By normative, what we mean is it becomes backwards compatible. So, right here, right now, as I said at the beginning, you can look at a condition resource in release three, and it can be different in release four. We might have taken stuff out, we might have put stuff in, we might have changed the name. There's anything we can do. Uh, once it's normative, we can't do that, it becomes fixed. So, moving stuff to normative is, um, is important. More implementation experience and connectathons. I can't overly talk about connectathons such as this one. Uh, we want more and more of those because that's where we see implementers using this stuff. We know what works and what doesn't. Moving beyond interoperability. We started out just sharing data, but people are using it for all sorts of stuff. For, for, for clinical knowledge, for actually representing clinical knowledge, cl clinical rules. Um, in the US, they're using it, for example, for um, the opioid uh, opioid issues, you know, when, 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 when is there an opioid issue? People are using it for persistence. They're storing fire resources. Again, we never expected that. It's not required by any stretch of the imagination. But a lot of people are taking resources, storing them in the database as resources, and banging them out on, 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 um, on request. Definitional resources. Care planning is quite a big one. A lot of, lot of effort going into care planning. The associated standards that I've... Um, uh, I've already touched on here before. We're seeing, again, a lot of people are wanting to do something and they can see FHIR as being a vehicle to help them do it. But I, I think really what sums up FHIR is this. So I was in Canada a couple of weeks ago and I gave a talk on I came across this. I thought this was beautiful. We are the Canadian Borg. Resistance would be impolite. <laughs> uh, so I sort of had to show that. I presume you all know what the Borg is. I do hope you all know what the Borg is. Um, so again... It, it, not in such an unpleasant way, but we are finding that people who want to do stuff in healthcare informatics come to fire to do that. And, and it's obviously something we, we welcome. So I, I just want to very, very quickly touch on, on how, I, uh, how I see what's happening over here in the UK, which is pretty rude of me since I don't actually live here, but I can do that because I'm up here talking and you're, you're not. Um, so you'll be familiar, of course, with InterOpen. This is an InterOpen event. Um, uh, curating profiles, uh, I, I think, and, and I've got the list down there, I think the key difference that I see happening here in the UK is that when you look in other jurisdictions, when you look in the US, for example, in Canada, um, um, Vietnam, actually there's a lot of work going on in Vietnam and fire at the moment, but by and large the people that are doing the work there are the people that were already involved in clinical informatics anyway. What has, seems to be happening over here is that the set of people that are involved in this work has extended out beyond that to the ordinary clinician who maybe wants to learn a bit more about it. So it, it feels like you're getting much more involvement from clinicians on the ground as you develop your profiles. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's a really good thing. 
But of course, you know, the counter to that is the more people you have with more differing views, there's going to be discussions and, and disagreements and so on moving forward. But I think it's the right approach. I think that that involving clinicians in the design of these things from the get-go is going to give you a better result in the end. Even if it might take a little bit longer to get there, um, you're going to get a better result, or a result that more accurately suits the needs of the clinical community. Uh, NHS Digital, of course, is involved in these things. I guess the one plea that I would make is that I've, I've seen the, the proposed standards for, for documents and such, like, and they're great, but I reckon you guys ought to be having collectathons. On these things. I think that rather than, even though the, the specs might have been created by a consensus approach, it might involve vendors, it might involve clinicians, at the end of the day you're going to come up with a spec that no one knows if it's going to work or not. The way to find out if it's going to work is to have a connectathon. And that connectathon could have clinical and it could have technical, aspect, technical aspects to it. You know, you could have organisations like Orion, Cerner, whatever, creating and consuming. Um, documents according to the spec, and then saying what works and what doesn't. Again, in theory, this ought to have been brought out in the curation process, but we all know until you actually have to do something, as you guys are going to find out this afternoon, until you guys have to, that's a bit of a warning by the way, the doors are locked, so you can't actually, you can't leave here. Um, until you do it, you don't know for sure. And I reckon that will save a lot of money if you do something like that before you launch into it because I think you're going to find issues. I'll bet you anything you like, you're going to find issues. I mean, this stuff is hard. Producing a, a, a clinically safe discharge summary with structured data is not a trivial job. It's a really hard job. You know? So again, I, w I would just urge that you, you do that. Um, and we are, I believe, getting towards the end. So this is the reality check slide. Um, back in the early days, we. Uh, uh, we were out there saying how great fire was, and you should really do it, and you should really do it, and everybody said, yes, okay, we'll do it, we'll do it. So now we're saying, slow down a wee bit, you know. So, sounds wonderful, but we've got to manage expectations about what fire actually is, because I think you're going to find issues. I'll bet you anything you like, you're going to find issues. I mean, this stuff is hard. Fire is a platform spec. Fire makes some things easier because it defines how to do stuff. But healthcare exchange is hard. It's complicated. And I, I'm building a house at the moment um, in, in, uh, in New Zealand, and this is, to me, it's kind of like an analogy of a concept plan. You know, you sort of sit down with a piece of paper and you say, oh, it's going to be nice, I'll draw this, I'll draw this. And, you know. and then you've got to go to an architect, and then you've got to go to a builder, and then you actually start the building, and then the whole thing. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to get windows in. We, we, we put in a window, we had to take it out because some bracing was, oh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So it's actually hard. So, and there's the Gartner hype cycle. We're not quite sure where the Gartner hype cycle, where we are on that one. My guess is that we're kind of sort of a little bit around here because as people start to do stuff, they realise that, you know, fire doesn't solve the world's problems. I guess it, it then says, well, what, what actually does fire really stand for then? <laughs> and that's, that's the real definition of fire. So that's all I have to do. Thank you very much yeah. for listening.